Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today we're asking, do dogs think and feel like we do? Or are they too busy thinking about, who's a good boy, who's a good boy? (laughs) But scientists have some very creative ways of figuring out how these good dogs think and feel. And some of them are pretty theatrical. Our listener Gray sent us this question. Do dogs think and feel the way we do? And he had a follow-up question. Are there any scientists who study animal feelings? Ooh, it's a two-parter. Yes. So let's ask our listeners, do you think dogs think and feel like we do? And how would scientists find out? Think about it, because when we come back, we're going to be barking up a tree for answers. Hopefully the right one. Okay, so we're going to start by tackling the second question first. And there is indeed a type of animal scientist who studies how dogs think and feel. Zachary Silver is one of them. So most of the time people bring their dogs into the lab and they say, oh, Zachary, we're so excited to see you because our our dog knows you as the treat supplier. That sounds like a pretty fun lab to be in for both the dogs and the humans who just get to pet them and say they're good boys. It really is a dream job. Zachary works in a canine cognition lab. Okay, so I think some of our listeners might know that canine just means dog. But can you explain what cognition means? Yeah, cognition has to do with what goes on in the brain. Getting information, storing it, and using it to guide your behavior. So he's in a lab that studies how dogs think and feel, which is exactly what Gray was asking about. Yes, and that's where Zachary is looking for answers to Gray's first question. First of all, Gray, I will tell you this is a fantastic question. Uh, And this is actually almost exactly what I study. I try to find out if dogs think and feel like we do. How does he do that? By putting on a play. What, like he's organizing a production of Hamilton? (laughs) That's a lot of words for the dogs to learn. (laughs) I show dogs what I call little plays. Oh, so he's showing the dogs the play. I was confused that the dogs were in the play. No, they're for the dogs to watch. The dogs are the audience. Sometimes we call them social interactions. How does a play or a social interaction help us learn what dogs think and feel? (laughs) Well, it's a way to work around the biggest challenge of finding out what goes on in a dog's mind. The puzzle of studying dogs or any population that you might work with that can't talk to you is we can't directly ask them a question of, what did you think about this? Or how do you feel about this thing that we just showed you? Why not just invent a dog translator? Because I feel like that would save a lot of work. (laughs) I am anxiously waiting for that to be invented as well. But in the meantime, scientists have come up with ways of making conclusions about dogs' reactions to things. Hence, the dog play. What we really are talking about here is looking back at dogs' behavior in a variety of of situations and trying to piece together what they are most likely thinking or how they most likely feel based on what they did in that situation or other situations similar to it. So it's like if you give someone a present and they open it and like act all excited and stuff and start jumping up and down, you can probably assume that you got them a good gift. (laughs) Exactly. So the play is a way to create a pretend situation like this for dogs. Okay. So I guess this is like when we watch actors perform, we know how they're feeling. I mean, if they're good actors. Yes. So Zachary believes that dogs can also pick up on how people are feeling by watching them. Because when we're little, we're actually not so different from dogs. What's so interesting about this is that dogs are able to do a lot of those things that human babies and toddlers are able to do. Wow, so dogs probably think about the world the same way we do, but how much? That's what Zachary wants to find out. And right now, Zachary's asking how dogs think and feel about how people act or behave. What kind of behavior is he looking at? He's looking at whether dogs can tell who's nice and who's not. 
So the, the motivation for the study really came from my sort of natural interactions with dogs throughout my life, but more recently as a professional working with dogs, I could really see that dogs would gravitate towards certain people. Meaning that there's like certain people that dogs seem to like. Yeah, I think we've all seen this and we're all a little happy when we're the people that dogs seem to like. <laughs> Zachary had an idea of why they behave this way. And I think that dogs kind of have this idea that is going on in the back of their minds, that people who behave nicely towards other people are likely to behave nicely towards them. Yeah, I mean, I think we kind of work that way. Like, we see someone being nice to other people, and we assume that they're going to be nice to us, too. Yes. So that's why Zachary wrote a play for dogs to find out if that's true. Are you ready for it? (laughs) We're going to get to see it. We're going to get to hear it. I've adapted Zachary's study into Tumble's first ever dog theater production. It's called Good Human, Bad Human. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing title. (laughs) I've actually cast it with the rest of our team at Tumble Media, who I'm rebranding as the Tumble Dog Players. (laughs) You get to start off. Welcome to Dog Theater, where we explore dog mind through plays. Our scene is set in the testing room. It looks like an ordinary office, but there's no desk. Instead, there's a small dog pen and a scientist inside of it. Just outside the pen are two clipboards. Help me! I'm trapped in a scientist pen, and I need to get this clipboard that's just out of my reach! Oh, good. Someone's here. Can you help me reach my clipboard? I shall slightly push it towards you. Got it. I love clipboards. Wait, don't go. I need that other clipboard, too. And it's also just out of my reach. Oh, good. There's someone else to help me. Can you push that clipboard towards me? No. I shall push it further from you. Wait, where are you going? Now I'll never get all my clipboards. And scene. You have been a very good doggy. Yes, you have. Now let's bring our clipboard people back in. They both have treats in their hands for you. Which one will you go to first? The person who helped our scientists with the clipboard? Or the person who made it harder? The choice and the treat are yours. Well done. <laughs> what, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, after this quick break, we'll go behind the scenes to understand the science behind the sure-to-be-dog Tony winning masterpiece that we've just performed. Okay, so before the break, we put on our very first play for dogs, and it left a lot to be explained. Yeah, I don't get how this is science. (laughs) I'll admit that the storyline is pretty rough. Oh. (laughs) There are plot holes big enough to bury bones in. (laughs) (sighs) I try as much as I can. I cannot stop you from the pun. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right, so where did he get the idea for this play? Because it sounds like he just wrote Dog's Clipboard Scientist Play into an AI script generator. So, like many playwrights, Zachary drew his inspiration from the greats who came before him. He took a cue from scientists who study human cognition. They'd come up with the plot of people acting nice or mean, but in their study, they did it through a puppet show for babies infants as young as five months old actually prefer to interact with nice puppets over mean puppets. Yeah, I feel like puppets wouldn't work for dogs because they just eat both of them. Zachary knew dogs wouldn't react to puppets the same as humans, so he switched them out for human actors. (laughs) I guess that makes sense. But why was the scientist trapped in a cage? (laughs) (laughs) A pen, and yes, it's hilarious. (laughs) 
it's essentially a scientist pen. It's actually made out of the same materials that a dog's pen would be made out of. How long does it take to crate train a scientist? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so the reason why the scientist pen is there is because dogs could relate to the person inside of it. Coming back to Gray's question of what dogs feel, well, maybe the dogs are feeling some empathy for me, that the dogs are feeling like, oh, this person really wants the clipboard and this person helps him. The other person doesn't. I think that that person that helps him is nicer and I should interact with them. So the dog sees this situation and he's like, I know what it's like to be in a pen. Maybe this person who helps the guy would help me when I'm in my pen. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, the person who helps the scientist is showing what it means to be nice. So speaking of, why does the scientist want a clipboard that seems like a random thing? The clipboard was selected for two reasons. One being, we knew the dogs wouldn't really care about the outcomes related to the clipboard necessarily. And then two, yes, we had it around. (laughs) All right. I mean, is he saying that dogs don't care about clipboards? Because I think that's probably true. (laughs) I cannot think of a single reason why a dog would want a clipboard. Unless it was made out of meat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Zachary wanted to use an object that dogs wouldn't care about. So they'll focus on the people rather than wondering if something had food inside. (laughs) That keeps the scientist's struggle front of dog mind. (laughs) The bigger picture idea here is that dogs know there's something between me and what I want. Okay, so it ends up being weird, but I guess I get it. So why do the two people act so weird? They are emotionless for a very good reason. We're not giving dogs a lot of clues about who's nice and who's mean. It's set up so the only difference between the actors is which direction they move the clipboard to help or not help the scientist. I mean, I guess the the mean one could have just thrown the clipboard out of the room and the nice one could have helped the scientist out of the pen (laughs) rather than pretending that that was normal. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that would have been actually nice. But Zachary wanted to start small. In fact, I didn't think dogs would be successful in this situation because the plan to really see this through scientifically was to start with the bare bones situation like this, where we fully anticipated dogs to not be able to do this. So did they do it? I mean, could the dogs tell who was nice and who was mean? Ah, there's the rub. As Shakespeare wrote, the play's the thing. (laughs) After the dogs watch the play, their thoughts and feelings are revealed through their actions. (laughs) This might be the only study methodology I've heard of based on Hamlet. So both of those people then just sit down on the ground and they offer the dog a piece of food. And we know dogs love food, so surely they're going to take that food from somebody. But we're curious who they will take the food from. So if the dogs take food from the nice person, it means that the dogs are thinking about who's nice on a pretty significant level. So are they thinking about who's nice? And what I find is that most of the time, dogs do take the food from the nice person. This is really interesting to me because it suggests that dogs are keeping track of who's nice and who's mean, and they would prefer to interact with a nice person than a mean person. Wow, so dogs are keeping like a running list of who's naughty and who's nice. (laughs) Just like someone we know. (laughs) So while we don't know exactly what thoughts are running through a dog's brain, the play tells us that they think about how people behave pretty much like we do. We're able to infer or make a very educated guess that dogs probably have some understanding of what nice means and what mean means. So what does it mean that dogs know what nice and mean mean? And can we know more than that? Well, that's just one of the many questions that dog cognition scientists are asking to find out how similar dogs are to us. And each answer adds up to a much bigger question. I think any time we find evidence for dogs being similar to humans, it helps us come a little closer to answering that big picture question of how did dogs get so smart? Maybe they just went to a really good obedience school. 
Zachary did find that trained dogs were better than untrained dogs at spotting the nice person. But the bigger question is about why all dogs are keen to be our companions. It could be that they develop these abilities by living alongside us, watching nice and mean people interact with each other throughout their life. Or maybe it goes back to their very early, again, that evolutionary history, where maybe they had a much better chance of getting food that night if they could find the people who are likely to share that food with them. So the question is, are dogs good because they watch us or because they watched our ancient ancestors? Maybe it's a little bit of both. We don't know yet. And being able to fully understand our furry best friends will take a lot of time, patience, and tons of dog treats. It is very slow to design a study to collect all the data, to analyze that data, interpret the data. Then usually after we get to that point, the next thing we do is we say, well, we don't really know the answer to the question yet. We need to go back. We need to do it all again. So does that mean that more dog plays are in the works? Yes. Zachary is definitely continuing in his career as a budding dog playwright slash scientist. Will he ever answer which dogs are the best dogs? No, he will not. (laughs) All dogs are great pets. So they're saying they're all good doggies, good doggies, good doggies. Yes, they're the best dogs. Who wants a belly rub? <laughs> now that you've learned how cognitive scientists put on plays to find out how humans and animals think and feel, come up with your own idea for a science play. Observe a pet or maybe a younger family member to come up with a question about how they think or feel about something. Then come up with a situation in which you could test their reaction. If you want to take it a step further, write your play and put it on. Does it work to tell you what your audience is thinking or feeling? If you put on a play, we'll love to hear about it. Email us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks to Dr. Zachary Silver, researcher at the Yale Dog Cognition Center and soon to be at Occidental College. Learn more about Zachary's work and his thoughts on cats in our bonus interview episode. It's available to patrons who pledge just a dollar or more a month at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll also have free resources to learn about dog cognition on the blog on our website, along with a transcript of this episode. That's at sciencepodcastforkids.com. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this show and designed the episode art. Elliot Hijaj is our production assistant, and Gary Calhoun James engineered and mixed this episode. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. The Tumble Dog players are me, Marshall, Sarah, and Elliot. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Science discovery.